Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California and we are a teaching institute dedicated to excellence in clinical knowledge and skills. Today we're going to talk about the complex amalgam part two which is the restoration. In part one of the video we disassembled this old build-up material and then we modify the preparation to receive the amalgam. So the preparation has completed and we're going to show you how we go from there to here. So the first step is going to be to place the rubber dam. And we're using here a W3 clamp on the second molar and we have Nictone rubber dam which is a non-latex rubber dam and it's blue and it photographs really well. We're going to be placing a universal matrix band, and this measures 0 0.0015 inch, which is about 38 microns. And we're going to twist the band so that the retainer head is not located where we're going to be replacing a cusp. That way we won't have excess amalgam pouring into the crease between the bands. We're going to place wooden wedges. I like standard wizard wooden wedges from the lingual and we'll push them in with a significant amount of force so that we can have a nice separation. Because this is an MOD, we need to push a little bit harder and we need to compensate for the thickness of the band, create a gingival seal, and also push the tissue, or the rubber dam in this case, out of the way. You notice that there is a little void on the mesial facial box area, and we're going to be placing a small customized wedge in that area to shim that and close that area. So I usually just take a piece of wedge and I'll carve it down with a scalpel or I'll break it and make it into a little splinter shape like this and then be able to place that little wedge in that particular area and with a little bit of pressure and a little bit of fooling around here with this we can usually get that to seal reasonably well. So you can see that that could be uh, sealed for the work that we're going to be doing. We're going to loosen the inner adjusting screw one quarter turn. This will allow us to expand the amalgam up against the band. We're going to burnish the band also against the contacts with a little ball burnisher. This will provide us with intimate contact and contour of the proximal contact. Proximal contact has to be anatomically shaped properly, so it's going to be oval shaped and it'll be uh, about a millimeter and a half tall by about two millimeters wide buccolingually. The amalgam I'm going to be using today is called Contour. It's made by Kerr. It's an admixed amalgam, regular set, and I'm using a double spill. So I've speeded this up after placing a, an appropriate sealing material in the cavity and I'm showing you how we would condense the amalgam into the cavity area. We're going to want to make sure we push significant force into the boxes and any of the retentive areas and continue to condense up against the walls and all the retentive features filling the amalgam above the band. This is going to take approximately three double spills of amalgam to fill a cavity of this particular size. As we get closer to the top, we're going to go ahead and switch over to a larger condenser and create a little bit of the shape of the final restoration. You notice that we're making some shape changes here. And we're going to use an egg burnisher to confirm the condensation. Make sure we have enough amalgam. If we're a little bit short, we can just add a little bit more amalgam in that particular area and condense it well. As long as you're working efficiently, and you're using a regular set alloy instead of a fast set, we'll have plenty of time to add additional amalgam should we see that there is a void or an under-contoured area. The key is to provide more amalgam than you really need so that you have room to work with. And once again, the egg burnisher here just confirming the condensation and providing us with a little bit of additional shape improvements. Now rather than carving the amalgam now, I'm going to do something a little different perhaps for you and that is I'm going to clear the occlusal embrasure all the way around the amalgam. 
not just in the proximal areas, but on the lingual, facial as well. And this is going to allow us to get the starting shape of the contours, but also is going to clean away the amalgam so that I can remove the band immediately. And some would think, why are you doing that? Why don't you leave the band in place and do some carving right now and wait for the amalgam to get hard? But I feel that by removing the band immediately, we'll have an opportunity to seal gingival areas that might have voids prior to the amalgam getting set. We'll hold the proximal down with a large condenser and we'll rotate the band out towards the lingual and simply repeat the process on the mesial side. Now the amalgam is still workable. Now we'll remove the wedges as the last step. So we're going to use the Explorer now to achieve the appropriate external contours, you know, the facial contour and the lingual contour, utilizing the adjacent tooth structure as a guide and also keeping in mind what the contour should look like based on our preoperative assessment and the adjacent tooth contours. It's important to try to keep the cusps facing inward a little bit, about six millimeters apart from each other, buccalingually. After wiping the tooth off just a little bit with a Q-tip, I'm going to use the IPC Interproximal Carver, which is very thin. It's only 200 microns thick, and we're going to make sure that the gingivals are sealed and that the embrasures have been created. All of the embrasures, all four of them, the gingival, the occlusal, the buccal, and the linguals. And we can also try to get the marginal ridges leveled out just a little bit as well so that they're not too high. The half Hollenbeck is great on complex amalgams because we can establish the cusps and the contours very, very well. And I like to look at the cusps from this view to make sure that I have the appropriate cusp height and cusp tip location. And the half Hollenbeck is an essential instrument for complex amalgams because it's just so good at doing all of these things. And we're just working the Hollenbeck carver in the external areas to make sure that we have the appropriate contour. We're following the contours on the facial and lingual and making sure the cusp tips are not facing out too far away from the tooth. This is a cleoid discoid and I'm utilizing the discoid end or the round end to find the margins. In other words, to locate the boundary between the preparation and the unprepared area. And I'm going to keep the instrument partially on tooth structure and partially on amalgam. So I'm not going to be free handing this so much, but I'm using the tooth as a guide to achieve a clean margin everywhere. You see that I frequently go back to the Q-tip to wipe off excess. Scooping out the fossa with the discoid side is a great trick. And I learned this from Dr. Bob Wolcott, who was a professor at UCLA and taught me how to carve amalgams. It gives you an idea where the fossa should be located, and then it allows you to create the more positive contours in between the fossa. In other words, the marginal ridge and triangular ridge areas. This tooth has a, a feature that we all love, the oblique ridge, and we're going to want to make sure that this is replicated in our final amalgam today. So we'll keep an eye on that as we progress through this carving process. Contour amalgam is such an excellent material to work with because it sets in about 14 minutes and gives you the opportunity to do a significant amount of anatomical development without starting to become burnished. Although the cleoid of the cleoid discoid is my preferred tool for developing grooves, the half Hollenbeck tip can also work quite well. But you do notice how I try to keep the instrument on tooth structure and amalgam simultaneously whenever I'm dealing with marginal areas to avoid ditching 
and creating a submarginal area. Allow the morphology of the tooth adjacent to guide you in how you're going to carve this particular amalgam. Always keeping in mind, of course, that we have different functional demands and occlusal relationships are slightly different between the first molar and second molar, but it should give you a pretty good guide on where things should be located. I've speeded up the video here, so this is about twice the speed that we normally would work at, but you can get the message here of how we're utilizing the cleoid discoid to develop the nuances of the secondary grooves, for example, and you could even place a tertiary groove if you, if you so desire. I like to stick to just primary grooves and secondary grooves. Simple anatomy has always worked out better for me personally, and I think that it creates a nice smooth tooth that the patient will feel okay with when they run their tongue over the surface. So we just used the cleoid end, and cleoid is derived from the Latin word meaning claw, and this claw shape works really well to get into the grooves and fossa of the amalgam restoration. So spend time kind of enjoying, I guess, uh, carving this and making it look a little bit more like the original tooth that we started with and wiping it off with the Q-tip at times, making sure the cuss tips are at the right height, and the grooves are centered, and that the fossa have a depth which is greater than the triangular ridges between them so that there's this morphological variation that will give this tooth more of a realistic view. All of this takes a little bit of practice. Practice makes perfect and I think that uh, after doing probably many hundreds of these large complex amalgams over the years uh, you tend to get a little bit better. The amalgam now is near the end of its workability. It's quite firm. I don't like to post carve burnish, although I'm sure that hardens the surface slightly. I'm going to leave this in this matte finish. I'm going to perform a polishing procedure in the next video, which will enhance the surface hardness and the morphology and smoothness of the surface. Dental floss is being used here just to verify the, the contact and you can see that we have a good contact that is wide enough buccolingually and tall enough uh, occlusal gingivally so that we have uh, no food impaction problems with this particular patient. And we tried to follow the morphology of the uh, amalgam to meet the tooth uh, even with that cusp of carabelli having a little nuance. So it's been uh, fun spending some time with you. I hope that this was helpful, and I really want you to look forward to the next part of this whole series, which will be the finishing and polishing of the amalgam, where we bring this amalgam up to a luster that I think will uh, provide the patient with the longest lasting restoration. Please comment, like, subscribe. Love to hear from you, and part three coming soon. Take care.